And we're back. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. I'm here with Steve Todd and I'm Alec Dinkoff. We're here to talk about open source workplace and what's new in the working environment. Specifically, something that I just read. Usually, Steve and I, that's Steve. Steve, introduce yourself. How are you doing, Alec? Good to see you again. Good to see you as well. Usually, we jump in and start picking his brain right away. But first, I've got to tell you about what I've read on Open Source Workplace just recently. It's 10 tips to building a successful remote team. Obviously, as a remote worker, this strikes home with me. And this article is great. It covers 10 amazing key factors that help remote teams become really, really successful. Really successful. And I wanted to share a couple with you and talk a little bit more about it. Dive in depth. Obviously, there will be a link to the actual article in the description here. And you can take a look on Open Source Workplace if you're interested. Um, it brings up the point of creating an off-site accountability for the remote worker. I just wanted to know, do you have any experience with helping people either obtain a sense of responsibility, accountability, or do most remote workers, obviously you've worked remote yourself as well. Uh, you seem like a self-starter. I myself am somewhat a self-starter. So if you want to give any tips that you use for yourself just to help create accountability, please share with our audience because I'm sure there's a lot of, whether it's team or managerial side, there's a lot of questions around this issue. Yeah, no, it, it's it's a great question. I think it's a really important topic. I think it's a lot of things that managers are really tussling with, right? From, from, from many aspects, whether it's you're trying to set up a complete remote team or whether you're trying to, you know, enable your employees to actually work from home a couple of days of the week and then come into the office. And, it, and it's a tough thing to balance. There's a lot of resistance because of just the... Uh, it's new, when I say new, is the last few years that the work from home has really become ideal with the you know, the evol evolution of so much as of technology, the technology permitting that. But uh, the key things, though, to your point, I, I, I'm a, I am a self-starter, but I kind of, as I've worked from home, I work from home typically two days a week. Um, I structure those two days for my, my focused activities. So what are the activities that I can really drill into, not be disturbed, and actually get on with? And then when I'm in the office, I try and ensure... Um, and we as a team do because there are a few people who work from work from home and we try to ensure that we're in the offices the same day so the teams in the office together on the same days that's when we have our team meetings that's when we bring everything together that's when we discuss everything and that's where we do a lot of our collaboration and then that permits everyone to have those couple of days um a week to actually go and focus, do a lot of their focus work it doesn't always work out that way sometimes it works out where you have to do a lot of collaboration on the phone um, you have to do uh, a lot of uh, focus work in the office as well. So how do you manage those things? Um, and sort of the way I sort of look at it, I, I kind of look at it trying to manage energy levels. Um, so whenever, you know, whether I'm discussing with um, a colleague or discussing with somebody who may report to me, okay, how do we set this up? How do we, how do we think about setting up a remote team? And I almost think about, okay, so does it actually work? And what you've got to do, the job you've got to deliver, but also manage your workload, your energy levels. Energy brings uh, vibrancy. It, bring, it sort of eliminates the mistakes. It eliminates errors. It just eliminates. It just, and, and I sort of, I, I watch energy levels all the time in, in the team. And I try to manage those things. And allowing people to have that uh, work from home flexibility may mean that they don't have a two hour commute a couple of days a week or three hour commute, whatever that is, that materially makes a difference. It takes a stress in the home life. It takes a stress of just that time and fatigue of it on the road, sitting in traffic and allows those energy levels to be um, preserved. But uh, sort of a guidance, whenever I sort of think about how do you sort of, uh, if you're gonna go work with somebody who is completely remote, so you take my day job, that's how that's structured, but open sourced, everyone's remote, right? All I have, what, 50 freelancers that I manage on for open source workplace, everyone's working remote. So how do I create accountability? Accountability is everyone knows they have to deliver and if they don't deliver, then they don't get another assignment. And that's the structure of the freelance model. Um, and I've been very fortunate that I've been able to identify really good people really, really quickly and I latch on to them and I do whatever I can to empower them, give them the autonomy to really perform the task that they're good at um, and then manage that sort of uh, ensuring that they feel I'm engaged with them, that I'm buying into what they're doing. I value their service and the product that they're delivering. 
and ensuring one that payments quick and two that actually the work just keeps coming because obviously when you're working in this environment um, where it is uh, you know your people are being paid per article or paid per performance or whatever that is then they need to be sure that things are coming quickly and I'm very fortunate that I've got down and I've managed that team in that way um, so to manage that it's it's constant interaction it really is updates it's reassurance that the work that's being done is um, is, is credible I, I appreciate it I share all the content that gets published with obviously each writer whenever an audio podcast goes out I share that with the writers as well when the animations go up I share that with the writers and I obviously give them the credit as well um, and that allows them to see that their work is being used and valued and therefore I think it almost helps repeat business because I'm a customer of theirs right so they're you know it's it, it's sort of a, it's a two-way thing and that's sort of what these how, how I think about managing um, the sort of the remote team uh, I actually put on a video on open source it's it's called GitLabs um, it's an interview that Y Combinator did on GitLab. GitLab, if you're, if you're not aware, is a fully remote team. These are, they are an open source uh, software platform. And uh, it actually talks about the lengths that they go to to bring those remote teams together. So they actually start and they, they, they basically give people 10 credits for uh, coffee breaks. So in other words, they get 10 credits where they can go and interact for 30 minutes with other GitLab employees for a coffee break where they'll get on and they'll do a video just like you and me and they'll sit and have a coffee. They're trying to, you know, break, uh, build up those social interactions, break, build up those uh, opportunity, water cooler opportunities, as we used to call them way back when. Um, so that basically people can share ideas, learn what each other's doing. Um, and uh, obviously that then becomes, they sort of mandate 10 whenever someone's brought on. So it becomes part of, the culture and part of what, what people do with that organization. So a big thing is how do you create that social interaction? How do you get people to buy in to the organization when you've got a full remote team to create video and to check out? And uh, they talk at length uh, the steps and things that they do to enable them to be successful. Um, and they actually have a handbook online that it's free. It's, it's, it's open source, right? So you can actually go and just get access to it. Um, and it's, a, it's, great read it's so detailed but because of how their organization is structured they almost have to over uh, emphasize and, and provide more information than probably required um because of the the remote locations so i i, I, know, I know once again i was very long-winded in that in answering your question but i think it's a really really interesting point question what it's it's amazing on the insight though because as a as a freelancer i completely understand uh getting to see your work especially uh a, maybe a pie that's been baked with a few with a few different hands right it lets everybody remember oh we're working towards something it helps show a greater purpose almost even though there's i don't have any interaction with any of the writers since i read the podcast and i do all the articles and i narrate but i've never met them but at least i i can see, see a portion of their style and they get to hear my in return my style it's there's more cohesion and we're we're a group although there is that disconnect but that's of course the freelancer side focusing in on the office environment um, those connections those water cooler moments right they're very important they're very important um, and that's why I wanted to kind of round this back in with laser focus you touched on a little bit of what's good, what doesn't work, or what, what should be done. But with a manager, this is specific to a manager that may be going into a new workplace, never managed a remote team before, or maybe a manager who's thinking about implementing a remote team or starting with one day at home or um, keep your energy up on a Wednesday or a Monday because nobody likes Mondays um, and save your two hour commute. For me, two hours in the morning is gold. It is the golden hour especially if I can get up out of bed early. Now, as a freelancer, there's, there's, there's different sides to that. But in an office environment, especially, especially, it can change your whole entire day. So for those managers out there that wanna, want to imp implement now or soon or are being thrust into the environment, do you have any specific tips, some things to definitely keep at the forefront of your mind? 
Yeah, it, it's it's got to be one-on-one -on -one interaction and then team interaction as well. Those those are the things that people buy into. People people really need that connection. They need to feel that. Um, in, and much more where we're in the where, where you're in the office and you're seeing people and interacting with people. There's a lot of uh, uh, um, accidental conversations that just happen. You're sitting in your seat, you lean over, you talk to the guy next to you. Whenever you're managing a remote team, you need to cultivate those. You need to create those instances, and it could simply be, you know, you have a daily catch up. Now, daily catch ups probably seem like, well, that's intense, but actually. It actually, what's going to work and individuals, there's going to be some individuals that need that daily interaction. There's going to be others that actually don't like that sort of level of interaction. But again, you're trying to get people to buy, build into a buy into a culture. You're trying to create that team dynamics. When you're working a remote team, the only way to do that is through interaction. And, and that's sort of the key thing that I would focus on. And, and the other thing you have to manage, you know, whenever I'm, I'm thinking about an office worker, I'm trying to manage their, their energy levels. Whenever you're managing home uh, remote workers, I think you almost have to be thinking about social interaction. You have to be almost thinking about their mental state because you know that depression can easily set in, the isolation can easily set in. Where if that's what somebody is and is constantly, so if someone starts and you get that a lot of social interaction and that falls away, those are red flags that you have to manage and you have to be alert to. And I think not only is it one-on-one -on -one personal interaction, I think you have to create those a lot more team dynamics. So maybe it's a, it's a lunch where everyone's on, on a video and they all, we all eat lunch together, you know, whatever it is, create those different moments that you sort of na naturally happen in an office. You have to really make an effort to stimulate and create those environments when you're managing a remote team. I like that, uh, that idea of having everyone eat while on camera. Um, I know quite a few people that that idea would strike horror because yeah. they don't want to see, let people see them eating or some people are, they're uh, very sound conscious, but the idea, right? You could mute your mic or, I mean, if we're on camera, I could move my mouth down <laughs> below, below where the, uh, the camera line is. So no one can see me take that, you know, fistful of right. sandwich into my mouth. Right. Um, so that's, that's a really neat concept. Um, and just as a throw out there, because I have a couple people that I've worked with before that they are very much the, I don't need team interaction. I don't want to be part of the team. Let me do my thing that I'm hired to do here. But if you put them in a group, they have fun. They right. do. They, they don't think they, need it, right. But there is that social aspect that almost recharges them. Um, hum, humans formed groups and tribes for a reason. So even if somebody's completely against it, they may still need it. Not everybody, but some. Couldn't agree with you more. Couldn't agree with you more. And, uh, you know, I, I'm as an individual, yes, I know that when I don't get that social interaction over, over a few days or whatever it is, I, 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 I totally feel it. Um, and uh, it's really important to keep, keep on top of that from everybody, no matter, no matter how much of an extrovert you are, how much of an introvert you are, we need that social interaction. And that's the responsibility of not only the, the, the manager, but also the employee. Right, the employee has to sort of take their responsibility and, and sort of speak to the manager. Like, I, I need this level of interaction with their team. I need this level of interaction. And, and obviously, when you have a complete remote team, it comes a lot more, a lot more natural. Or if you are one person that works remotely and everyone else is in the office, that interaction is going to be different. And you have to make the employee and the team are going to have to make special um, efforts to actually bring that uh, collaboration together. Of course, of course. Now. Speaking of team collaboration, there's something that specifically in 10 tips to building a successful remote team, they dive into, uh, they focus on the techno technology aspect, the investing in the right technology for your team. This can be great. This can be done wrong. And actually I was in an organization where there were a few remote workers that were on the same job description as other people. There were in office people and then there were some remote workers. They were good at their job, but they just worked remotely. Um, and as time went on, either people changed, there were more people in the office, less remote workers, and that number started to dwindle lower and lower. But there was a chat service that everybody was supposed to use and the remote workers were always on it. But then it got to the point where everybody in the office, they never used it. Um, they could try their phone or leave an email 
And if they don't get to them in time, then maybe they'll handle it tomorrow. So the chat service was turned into only used for urgent methods, whereas this article suggests the chat service being used to keep people in touch, interacting, keep that social connection. So that social connection started to fall away. And then it, so the people, the peers on the same level as the remote workers stopped using the app. Then the managers stopped using the app and they only used it for emergencies. So the only time that they would ever get a message from someone in the office was if something horrible has happened. Well, bad news. So that chat, whenever there's a message, it's always bad news. So that starts to be a re reoccurring thing in your mind. Well, it came to the point where they weren't checking it anymore. So it was completely useless. And then the managers would get frustrated because, yo, they're never on this, tech this technology that they're supposed to be using, but the managers never use the technology to associate or interact with. It was a bad feedback loop. And it, it just didn't work out well. They even had a remote sales team, but they weren't incorporated with this, this group. So again, there's that disconnect even between teams, between peers, and between managers. So I just wanted to share that story of how technology can be used incorrectly in a remote working environment and see if that kind of sparks anything in your mind to say, hey, that, that could have been done better. No, of course it can. A lot of it is the culture, right? And the culture is almost the habits and how, how do you, how do people use that? And it's etiquette, right? So what are the, what are the rules of engagement and so on and so forth? And, and that's why, you know, the GitLab handbook, they're very crystal clear on how you use these technologies, what technology you should use and only can use. And the, the incentive being that actually to avoid the outcomes that you just did. And, and sometimes when you're in that work environment, sitting in an office, someone emails you you get that messages or you get that message that says can i call you it's like you know years ago we used to pick up the phone and call somebody and if they were available they would answer but today it's it's a message can i call you and then it's you know sort of a lot of it is redundant um but uh i think technology has almost allowed us to develop these remote workers right and allowed us to work from home um, but to your point, right, the rules need to be set on how they're, they are used. And I, I know in the organization I work at, there are multiple, you know, messaging tools, different groups use different ones. And some of them are a lot better and used for very specific things. You know, software development, they use their own specific tools because of how it's structured, how it's set, and, the, and just the sort of things it allows them to do. But on a simple chat basis, um, yeah, we, we have we have another one that we use, but uh, technology again, it's 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 going to evolve. And you and you look what we're doing here on Zoom. You know, um, these have been rolled out all across the world, and it's easy. It's very easy to use. And I think the technology that probably needs to be leveraged more is the the video communication, especially for remote workers. Just being able to see people, feel people. Whenever people know they're going to be on camera, they dress a little differently. You dress a little differently. You feel a little different. You dress like you're going to be at work and you're going to be seen from work colleagues. So therefore, the interaction is a little bit different, a little more professional. And I think that's important too. Yeah, um, actually, we've covered articles in the past that have suggested that dressing for work improves productivity. So not only are you saving energy by not having that 45-hour, two-hour commute, but then you're also looking the part. It's very good. It's a good yeah. feedback loop in yeah. this case. Well, thanks. I, I'm glad I got to pick your brain on this. It's a wonderful, wonderful, whoop, whoop. It's, it sounds a lot better on the podcast <laughs> and it, it reads a lot better than I speak right now. Um, it's a great article. Check it out on open source workplace description or link will be in the, the, the description. Sort of, yeah. And just one thing to sort of finish on that. And, and this subject is so important, right? Um, and you know, everyone wants to do it the right way and everyone's looking for tools and help on how you do do it. And that's one of the reasons why I did create workingfromhomeinsider.com. Um, it is owned by Open Source Workplace, but actually all the content there is specifically for working from home employees. That's people who want to start their own business and work from home. That's people who may be interested in working from home. How do they do that? What are the things that they need? And, and, and that's the site that I'm looking to build in relation and owned by Open Source Workplace but specifically dedicated to working from home. Man, I've got some comments for that website. But anyway, that's a whole, that's a whole different video. Uh, speaking of websites, though, let's dive in. Open sourced workplace, what's new? 
Yeah, so um, we're we're almost at three thousand co-working locations, and so I'm super happy about that. Um, got a whole plethora of new, uh, obscure co-working locations around the world. Um, I've had to add new locations to the sites in Babway because we've added um, uh, Venezuela for whatever reason that location wasn't in there, but uh, we're we're adding those as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's really interesting. I think this week we, we added locations in Egypt. Um, and uh, it's just fascinating to see the different co-working locations around the world, how they're all different, how different people are sort of creating this co-working culture. You know, when you go back to what we were just talking about, that's one of the reasons why co-working really does take off because it allows those people who maybe don't want to work, who work remotely, but maybe don't want to be at home all the time an opportunity to go and interact with other people and get that sort of social interaction that we know is so important um uh, so what else what else this week we also released the second uh video animated animation of uh um the the employee experience advantage uh by jacob morgan it's a great book um and obviously that was written by Dan, narrated by by alec and then we had the animators put it together for for a video presentation which again, it just transforms the, the storytelling, it transforms the comprehension, the illustration of, of, of what Jacob's trying to, to portray in the book. So we got a nice thumbs up from Jacob on uh, uh, LinkedIn and, and Twitter. So, so that's cool. So that's good. Again, it just, it just feels it's just reassuring that you feel like you're doing the right thing by these authors. Um, I have an article gonna come out this week that's a regular article um, that we're going to put uh, an animation to. So really, really curious to see how, one how that turns out, but two how it's received, um, and whether it gets as much uh, much much playback. So, so that's really what it is. There's obviously a lot more content. I'm really interested to see the analytics of of the page views, and, it, and it's quite hard to to judge how many page views we're getting in a month right now because I have so many people on the site doing stuff, adding stuff, changing stuff. So. I mean, I looked at the page for you kind of just before we get on here. It's just below 12,000 for the last month. Um, you know, given the site's been up for two months, that's that's really good. I'm really happy with that. And um, the other thing I'm noting is a lot more of my traffic's coming from Google search. So that tells me that Google's starting to like, get familiar, and trust the content, um, which which is a great, great sign, given, again, that the, the, the site's only been up for two, two months. Um, so, again, I'm really excited i have a number i want to get to um and it's a big number but uh yeah but everything everything's going really well uh getting really good feedback um but again i just want to uh i just want to continue to provide provide the content for for everyone on open source it's you mentioned page views and where they're coming from and how many are actually uh either employees people working on the website etc cetera, etc cetera. um I bring this up because I work with a, a web designer who now runs their freelance own business for web design. And they used a tool called uh, Hotjar. And if you've never heard of Hotjar, Steve, I, uh, I'll explain a little bit more. I can give you a link after if you're curious. But what it does is every time a visitor shows up, um, and obviously there's different plans. So if you want it unlimited to do everything, right, there's a paid plan. But it, it records their screen movements and where their mouse goes and where their mouse clicks. And then it assigns them their IP address, not their IP address, but like a, like a name for that person. So if they come back, it'll be the same name or a string of numbers, et cetera. Mm. So you can see if, if somebody's coming in over and over again, but then since it shows their page and where they're scrolling and viewing, you'll know that if somebody goes into the back end and clicks on a developer tab, that's one of yours. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If somebody goes over and says, edit, upload article, obviously that's your writer. It's just an interesting tool that it's yeah. almost creepy in a sense that technology's come to the point where, uh, I mean, every website now disable cookies or, hey, we use cookies. Do you accept? Um, but this is uh, next level where you can actually see what their eye is drawn to, what when they scroll, where they stop. Um, it's it's the next level. Um, yeah, no, I, I think it's fascinating. It'd be really interesting to see. And I actually think that uh, I can see why marketers would really want that information and evaluate that information if they're going to market on your site. Um, now, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, I'll definitely take a look at that.
Okay, okay. Well, that's something I can shoot over later. And that'll be obsolete in 10, 20, 50 years when we all have glasses that show <laughs> where our eyes look. So um, anyway, that's beside the point. Bes besides what's new with open source workplace, now you mentioned a new article that's gonna be animated. Are there any other new articles on the horizon that you're just really excited about that you have to share with us right now? Something you've read, um, something that's coming out? No, and, and it's, it's, um, it's not so much um, the articles that's sort of a specific article. I, I sort of get excited whenever I find a train of thought or a group of, con some of the content that actually isn't really too well presented um, elsewhere. And I think that I have the ability to sort of, you know, get writers and, and truly nail into the some things. Some of it is on workplace flexibility, um, where I, I, I think we all, I mean, you go back to what we were talking about before, workplace flexibility and what that is. And, you know, there are a lot of people trying to create those environments. They want to understand, okay, what does that mean for talent, for retention, um, from a workplace design perspective? What does that mean from employee engagement and experience? And then how do you manage those type of things? So those, those, whenever I get those little things, that's what gets me excited. It's not necessarily a specific article that I've, I've just posted. That's got, I have just posted some articles that are really good. Um, but, uh, but uh, not, not that, that's sort of where I get excited, where I find something that I just know that isn't being touched upon just, just are too well. Um, so that's what gets me kind of excited. But my article length list is like so long. Um, I don't know when those articles will get published. It's, it's really, as I said, I, I leave it all to, all to my writers to sort of select the title that they want to they wanna write about. But, uh, but yeah, but no, so go check out Open Source Workplace and see what's new there today. Well, I'll tell you what's new on the podcast, though, because that's what I'm yeah, excited yeah. for. This, go, yes. We are in the thick of the Leesman Index Review. Um, and they're a great source for information. These studies, these surveys, they compile so much data and they turn it into either raw facts or interesting stories. They're, it's really great. Um, and it's a 10, 12 page article and we're coming out with a podcast for each and every article that's in there. And we're about halfway through uh, next Monday, uh, Monday, the, let me get the exact date. So in case somebody's watching this in the past or future, uh, Monday, the, March, 25th will be the last episode for the this Leesman Index Review, and everything will be released from there. It's great. You should check it out. Link will be in the description here. Great, great. You know what I think about Leesman. I think they're awesome, so it's good. I look forward to listening to those. Well, I enjoyed reading them. I hope everybody enjoys listening to them. But even if you're not going to listen to it, even if you're only going to watch this video, you should like, you should share, you should subscribe, you should send this out to everyone on their social media, on your social media rather, because they may enjoy the podcast, they may enjoy this video. And as for us, unless there's a curveball, Steve, you like a curveball? No curveball no? today, thank you, Alec. <laughs> well, then that will end the episode. We'll see you next week. We go live every Wednesday. You can catch us every Wednesday here on our YouTube channel uh, or check out the articles we mentioned on Open Source Workplace. Have a good one.